this this is uh, four and a half years in the making since we've started that uh, six week body transformation program. February of January, February of 2014. And we knew right off the bat that um, we had a few of the ideas, concepts of control. We're quite confident as far as our training program, our nutrition guidance, and all that stuff. And we knew we were missing that component right from the get go. So I've been waiting for this guy for four and a half years. And so he's finally made a trip uh, from Sacramento to come here. Um, He's an amazing guy. Uh, we've known each other for close to three months now, just all of our correspondence on the phone, um, Facebook, and, and the like. And, but we finally got to meet each other uh, this afternoon and, and as part of his team. And it's just been a, a cool experience just hanging with these guys. I, I wish he would stay in Jersey, but um, at some point, I'm sure they're going to find their way back to the West Coast. But. Um, He's done some amazing stuff and working with people that have had um, fallbacks from after body transformations and things that, you know, similar to what we do. And you can see that these, these things with programs are, are everywhere. Um, I think in this area, we were the first ones that started and you saw how quickly it, it gained um, some momentum with other gyms and programs in the area. And, and thank God, because it's something that needs to be addressed. And, you know, we have quite a, a uh, epidemic with um, overweight um, majority of our population and obesity, and, and it has to be addressed. And we knew four and a half years ago we had to address it because the other stuff is great, you know, training and working with athletes and performance and all that stuff is cool. And I, I was the advocate of the gym industry, but, you know, it became much bigger much more important as the years have gone by, but we've been doing our best to address uh, with our programs uh, how, how we can have an impact on people that, you know, we always consider it just a weight loss, you know, challenge or goal, but it becomes much more than that, and it's much larger than that. So this is why, I guess, I was um, blessed enough, we were blessed enough, my team and I were blessed enough to be introduced to Dr. Mondo. Um, since we've been, Mentioning his um, his trip here to the East Coast, I'm sure some of you Googled him and found out what he's done and, and the impact he's made and, and the passion he has to really, you know, change how things are done in, in, in working with people that have weight issues and emotional eating issues and all that stuff. And I used to think that was hard stuff, you know, hard wash, you know, the emotional side of it. But you know, the more I, I'm presented with you know, you know, just conversations, talking with people, it's, it's real, and, and um, I wish we started this uh, conversation four and a half years ago, but um, in no due time, we finally have Dr. Mondo here with us tonight. He's gonna do uh, amazing, amazing things, I believe, in the next half hour. So, um, could you give a round of applause for Dr. Mondo? Stop the emotional eating. Are you on the right track and stop the emotional eating? 
Keep an open mind and learn. Keep an open mind and learn. It's something that sometimes we don't always do, right? Yep, yeah. someone else over here? No, one more. I wanna learn or understand shame. I wanna understand how it affects us, how it drives into us, and how we can try to find ways to battle it. Love it, love it. So I can confidently say everything that we just heard from you guys, we will cover tonight. Um, and I'll say, we talked about shame, and I don't know if some of you guys saw, but we have this this hashtag, uh, slaying shame. Anyone see that? That's what we're, we're here to do tonight. Um, just by being here tonight, we're slaying shame. I, I really believe that, as I was getting ready to come here tonight, that for some of you, it's a really, really, really big deal to leave your home tonight, to be here, and to acknowledge the subject matter that we're getting ready to talk about. I think that for some of you, uh, it's not just uh, a small thing to be here tonight, and I really, I think part of the reason for that is because we live in a weight-shaming society. Did anyone know that, or am I breaking news right now to you? No? You guys do that? It's a weight-shaming society. Yeah, so what does that mean? That means that Little girls as young as three years old right now. Do you know that little girls as young as three years old? I got a, I got a little girl at home. She's two months old today. Yeah. Little girls as old as three years old. So she's got a little bit of time before she's three. And when she's three, little girls start to fear being fat. Because they know the connotations in our society with what that means. So what are some of the connotations that it means to be fat or overweight in this society? Lazy. Yep, needs to be lazy. What else? What else do we say about people in this society? What is it? Slow. 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 Like mentally slow or physically slow? Physically. Physically slow. Lazy, physically slow. No, they don't have any willpower. Ridiculed. 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 Not smart. More shame, not smart. Now, with all of that said, how many people in this room at some point have been overweight? So if all of us are raising our hands, there's a chance that someone in this room at some point felt like they weren't smart, felt like they were considered lazy, that there, that there was something wrong with them, right? That means all of us at some point have been given the message that who we are as people is defined by the number on the scale. And how many people, excuse my language, think that's a crock of you know what? Anyone feel that way? So if you do, that's why we're here tonight, to slay shame. Because what we're trying to do right now is we're trying to say that our health matters. It matters to be a healthy weight, right? But it doesn't matter for the reasons that society says it. Why does it matter for, for some of you to be healthy? Like, what, what's your why? Why be healthy? Why be healthy? My children. Your children. Why? What about your children? Yeah, to be around for your kids, to set the example for your kids. Yeah, so on. Same stuff, yeah. Grandkids. Grandkids. Feel good. To feel good, right? How many people have a family history right now that they were born into that says that they're destined to have diabetes or heart disease, or <laughs> right? Okay. So maybe that's part of someone's why. That you want to be part of what changes the current of what you've seen time and again in your family. So that's what we're here tonight to do. We're here to slay shame and to get you guys in a position to, to look at your health journeys in a brand new way. And so some of you know who I am, and, and, and for those that don't, just the, the quick backstory is, honestly, the easiest thing to know about me is that I can relate to all of you, okay? Forget whatever title's in front of my name, forget anything else. I grew up as an overweight kid, in a single parent household. My mom and dad split when I was three, and I grew up with just my mom. And I remember as a kid, at a young age, like I look back at pictures and I saw when I was like three, I started to gain weight. And then after that, I could just remember going home to an empty house and eating a lot, you know. Didn't have any siblings, it was just me and my mom. So to know me is to probably know that first and foremost because I don't want anyone tonight to think that I'm talking at you. I'm talking with you. I've experienced this. 
I'm also someone that you should know has been through weight loss transformations. Notice how I put an S on the end. I'm the only one in here I know, but I've actually lost the weight and gained it back. Anyone ever done that before? Yeah. I know, I did it eight times. I wanted to try it out. Someone said if you did it four or five times, it was a different experience, right? So, but that, that was the different experience. It's just, it gets harder and harder to lose the weight. Anyone realize that, right? And you know what else happens too? The shame gets worse. Doesn't the shame get worse? The way that you beat yourself up, it gets worse and worse and worse. So that's what you need to know first and foremost about me is that I'm someone that walks in your shoes because I never say that I'm over the hump, so to speak. Now, who I am and why I'm, I guess I'm relevant enough to be here is because there's a television show called The Biggest Loser. Anyone ever watch that show? I auditioned. You auditioned for it. There you go, even better. Uh, I know there's mixed things about The Biggest Loser, right? There's some things that just were wrong about The Biggest Loser. Give me one thing you liked about The Biggest Loser, though. What did you like about it? I loved watching the people change from the day they started to when they ended, how proud they were of themselves. Oh, wasn't that awesome? Yeah. To me, that was the first time in television that we finally got to see people stories behind the transformation. I do a Facebook Live every Tuesday night where I interview people about their weight loss transformation. The research I did with The Biggest Loser was all based off of that. I knew there was a story to tell behind the transformation. And to me, for all the bad things The Biggest Loser did, he did that thing right. Yeah, he told the story. He got to see the transformation. So I got a chance to do the first research study with NBC's The Biggest Loser. I'm a licensed uh, therapist. What do you guys think? I'm from California. What do you guys think of therapy in Jersey? Be honest with me. I've, I've been told you guys are very honest people. So I expect nothing less. What do you, what, what's the, what, what's the, the culture around therapy out here? Is it like, is it good? <laughs> We're good. Okay. That's encouraging. Okay. Okay. Because a lot of times, like, you walk into a room, you don't want to tell people you're a therapist. So a lot of times I just leave it at therapists. So they ask me, like, if I can massage their back, or look at their L4, and I'm like, I don't know what that is. Anyway, uh, I'm a licensed therapist, and, you know, when I got into this, you guys know my story, so when I got into this, I had a mission in mind. It was that every time I went through this weight loss transformation stuff, I knew there was emotional stuff happening in my head. I knew my relationship with food and my relationship with taquerias and Taco Bell and McDonald's extra value meals and quarter pounders with cheese, extra cheese. I knew there was something to that that had to be explained by psychology. So that's why I became a psychology major. I wanted to help people. I also knew that when I went through the experience of losing weight, I talked to other people and they said, you know, the world kind of looks at you different when you lose weight, right? Yeah. Can I get an amen to that? Amen. Yeah. Amen, they look at you different. People treat you different. That same boardroom that you sat in and no one wanted to have anything to do with your ideas, all of a sudden they're listening to what you have to say when you lose weight. Some people also notice that the opposite sex or same sex or whatever your preference is, is all of a sudden a little bit more interested in you when you lose some weight. Can I get an amen? amen. And to some people that's great, right? It, 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 it leads to more likes and loves and hearts and wows on the Facebook profile pictures. <laughs> but also it can be uncomfortable if you spend most of your life overweight. You're not used to that. The story you tell about yourself doesn't exactly match up to that. So I knew that when I went into grad school, there was something there about the psychology of weight loss. And I figured, surely people have done studies on it, and it's this big old thing. Guess what? I was shocked. There wasn't much research. There's tons of research on obesity. There's tons of research on weight loss. But there's not a whole lot of research on the psychology behind weight loss for everyday people like you and me. If you had a bariatric surgery, not saying that's not an everyday thing. It's very common. There's research on that, but we didn't really have a roadmap to understanding what emotional changes do people go through when they lose weight. And yet, medical research said over and over that keeping the weight off long term is one of the hardest things to do. Some estimate it's, it's, it's so hard that only like five or 10% do it long term, right? So how is it that we have an industry so big, a billion dollar industry, that is able to help people lose weight, but it's not in the business of allowing them to keep it off long term. Something sounds wrong with that, right? 
So what I wanted to do is I saw a vision of being here in front of rooms like this when I was in my first year of my doctorate program. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the doctorate program. It's long, right? It was a five-year program. But the first year, I had visions of being here in front of rooms like this. And, and my vision was basically this, that I was going to go into rooms like this, and I was going to use what I believe is my God-given gift to encourage and inspire people, but I was also going to do some research to let you know that you're not all alone. And to also give you some keys to the car, so to speak, on how you can be successful long-term in keeping the weight off. Anyone interested in that at all? I don't pretend to have all the answers right now, but I think I have some that can really help you tonight. So what I'm here to do is to share with you some of the research of what people who keep the weight off long-term do mentally, emotionally different in order to be successful. If you want to read the dissertation, anyone struggle with falling asleep at night? <laughs> yeah? Okay. Google my, my dissertation. <laughs> We have enough clinical studies to validate this, but it is a great sleep aid. If you get past the first three pages of all that jargon, then you, yeah, you're doing something, okay? You really have a sleep disorder at that point. If you get to page five, I don't know what to tell you. See your doctor. No, I'm not that kind of doctor. So I basically took my dissertation and I wanted to boil it down into two simple things. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. There's two simple things that are going to make you successful long term. Two simple things. We'll talk about that in a minute. Oh yeah, I, I know a lot of people in this room, uh, just the way our society is at ADD. So uh, if you're gonna like search stuff on your phone, you can just check out some stuff right there. There you go, there's some things to check out. It's my Facebook page, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. You know, let your, let your mind go wild. Okay. So you can't see that, but on, if you can a little bit, on the left is the whole before and after, right? And. Uh, yeah, you want to keep this just right here, you can see it. So yeah. So th this is me right here, um, in case you didn't know. And uh, my, my, the most I ever weighed, I got up to the 300 range, I don't know. Um, and I would love to say that I used to have, a, there was another, in fact, we just edited this, there was another after picture, and it was from like three or four years ago, but then we had to take that one down because I gained the weight back again, and then this is the most current after picture. And honestly, if you ask me, uh, part of what I'm going to tell some of you tonight, because I've lived it myself, is I don't really care, I don't want you to have to go through the eight times that I went through. But I want you to know that it's a journey, not a destination. Some of you have a gold number in your head right now that you want to reach, and then all of a sudden you're going to unlock this incredible life, right? You're going to love yourself. You're going to have really healthy relationships. You're going to stop people pleasing. All of a sudden you're going to stand up for yourself. I want to tell you right now, if that's what you think, it's a rigged carnival game. Every year I go back to the, the carnival, and I, I mean the carnival, the fair, the state fair in Sacramento. I'm a sucker for that basketball hoop game. I like to play <laughs> basketball, but every time it's like make 28 shots in 22 seconds, and I'm like, I'm gonna do it. And I just keep shelling out money after money after money after money. I lose all my money, my wife gets frustrated with me. But I do it year and again. The same thing is what all of us are doing. We're indoctrinated in this belief system that if we lose a certain amount of weight, we're all of a sudden gonna unlock this self-worth, this self-love, this new life. I'm here to tell you that that life can be lived right now, regardless of the number on a scale. I learned to eventually love that big old dude with the double XL sweatshirt. I learned to live, I, I learned to love him. And when I finally learned to love him, I was able to become the guy on the right. And spoiler alert, I'm the same guy on the right that I was on the left. But I had to get to a point of realizing that my journey of self-love was way more important than the work I was even putting in here. And how many know the work you put in here is hard, right? Not as important. The most important thing you can do is focus on that internal story, rewriting your story. That's the most important thing you can do. So the, the two biggest things that we learn from from the research to break it down. These are two things. So tonight, when someone asks you uh, what you learned, these are the two things, right? 
People who kept the weight off long term did two things. Number one, they focused on rewriting their story. Number two, they renegotiated their relationship with food. Sound like you need a lawyer for that, right? <laughs> Anyone got a good lawyer? Any lawyers in here tonight to help us process some renegotiation paperwork with Taco Bell Chalupas? Anyone in there? No? <laughs> I'm going to explain what those two things mean for you guys now. So, if you had a relationship status with Facebook, where you had to declare what kind of relationship you were in with burgers and fries and burritos and what else? What else are some trigger foods around here? Come on, help me out. Pizza. pizza. I miss pizza. What, what else? Possible. What is it? Ice cream. Come on, obvious one. Yeah, obvious one. Yeah. Now everyone's hungry. Okay. My, my talks are linked to binge eating. It increases after I mention all these foods. Subliminally. I'm sorry. I'm supposed to help with this stuff. If you had a relationship status with with some of your favorite foods, ice cream, pizza, what would it be? Would it be? Hey, I'm in a relationship. You know, this relationship's been about 18 years. It links back to when I was a kid. Every day that I went and spent some time with Dad on the way home, we'd stop, we'd get donuts, we'd get ice cream. It's a way that I bond. I go over to my family's house. Hey, we're Italian, and you know, or we're Mexican. You know, I, part of the way that we do love is through food. So I'm in a relationship. As a matter of fact, I'm engaged. I think we're going to take it to the next level. Uh, we really, you know, it's time to come out with it. Let's stop. Let's stop messing around. Let's get serious here. Or, you know, are you in a different state now? Are you in an open relationship? Like you explore with different foods. One night it's pizza, the other it's ice cream. You know, what's your relationship with food like? Romance. It's a romance. <laughs> what? You the marbles? Okay. So. What I want you guys to be asking yourself tonight is, what is your relationship with food? What is your relationship status? Now look, we all have a relationship with food, because why? It's not like if you drink emotionally, right? You, you, you're an emotional drinker, like you feel overwhelmed and you stuff your emotions by drinking. I could do six Boston creams like you do six shots. There you go. <laughs> and the problem is this, you have to eat to live, right? You have to. So you can't avoid food. So we all have some sort of relationship with food. Can we get the lights back on just a little bit? Thank you. But I think that what I'm talking about is that we all have to eat to live, but I think a lot of us use food as a way uh, to cope with our difficult emotions to cope with difficult and stressful days. I think some of us only know half the surface of what that even means. I think some of us right now couldn't identify what they were feeling if I put a feeling chart in front of them. I think some of us are so busy that we don't have the margin in our lives to even sit down and say, what's really going on with me? Because our lives are constantly going from one thing to the next. So the way we operate is that most of us operate with an emotional jar, imagine that this jar is kind of this feeling state. It's not just feelings, it's also stress, okay? And most of the time, the, the jar is at about half full, right? So what does emotional eating look like? Let me explain emotional eating to you. Emotional eating is Sunday night, the jar is right about here. You get that anxiety, because you gotta go to work tomorrow. You finish Westworld. And then you go, you know, you go to bed and you're like, oh God, tomorrow's the start of the week. I don't know why I have anxiety. And so suddenly more marbles are entering the jar. And then you wake up and of course the kids, man, they just, they're not ready. It's, they're, they got a case of the Mondays. You got a case of the Mondays. We're adding a bunch more marbles into this jar, right? And then you're thinking, oh God, I'm going to be late. I can't be late. If I get written up, I'll tell you, this jar is going to overflow. You go into work and of course you're late and you go there and what do you got? You got 200 unread emails, right? Most of them, like what are half those emails? That puts more marbles in the jar. Can anyone relate to some of this right here? Yeah? So the day goes on and all of a sudden, you know, Becky from accounting walks by and is like, God, what is Teresa's deal? She's in kind of a mood today. Because she could tell, people could tell that your jar is this full, right? 
And it's almost to capacity, it's almost ready to overflow, and it's already Monday. And then you realize, my God, I told Matt I'd make it to the lift tonight, but I forgot my shoes. Oh, he'll think that's convenient. I can't work out. Jars full. Oh, it's almost the top. And then something magical happens. An idea, like a little cloud pops over your head. You have this thought that I've had, we've all had. Somehow we all have the same thought. And the thought is simply, hey, you know what sounds good right now? Anyone ever had that idea? You know what sounds good? It's 11 o'clock and you're already thinking, you know what sounds good? And this jar just disappears. All of a sudden, you know what sounds good tonight? Pizza sounds good. Yeah, you know what? Pizza does sound good. You know, I didn't forget. I lost my gym shoes and whatever. I mean, I might as well just have pizza. It's been a rough day. I deserve this. When's the last time I did something like that? In fact, I'm two episodes behind on Westworld, so I might as well go home and catch up. Kick my feet up and just have a night for me. You know, I really deserve this night for me. And so the whole day, you know that they actually found in addiction research, when they look at someone's brain, the most exciting part of actually doing the drugs is anyone know? Anticipation. Anticipation. Getting the drugs. Oh, that's the best. Right? Isn't that the best? Anticipating getting the drugs. Oh my God, I, I, I'm thinking about it. I'm going to order this pizza. Should I go with the, the I'm going to go double meat. Let's go all meat, actually. Yeah, you know, might as well. I'm sure there's a coupon for that anyway. We justify it. So we start thinking about it. The minute that that enters our mind, some of us use food as a way to not just eat our feelings away, but just the idea gives us a sense of relief. Am I the only one that's ever felt that before? So what happens, you know, we, we, we have our rendezvous with our lover. We go, we, we go through the drive through We stare at the board with the big primary light staring back at us. We say, and you know what? While you're at it, throw in a McFlurry. And I think I'll do something off the dollar menu too. You know, you just really go all in. And you go that night, and you go home, and you just set it all up, and you watch your show, and you eat. And then, at the end of the night, Unfortunately, what happens? You feel so dirty. This thing reappears, right? All of a sudden, it was gone all day. But the jar reappears, and not only does the jar reappear, but there's another marble that gets dropped in the jar. And the next one is, it's deeper than guilt. What's, well, what's more powerful than guilt? Someone said it earlier. Shame. Shame comes in. Oh, God, here we go again. Every time I say I'm going to do something, uh, I always felt bad. I know I'm going to gain weight. Oh, my God. And i got to think about going to the gym tomorrow. You know what? Tomorrow's Tuesday. Do I really want to go? Maybe I won't go, you know? And so what, what happens? The jar actually ends up more full. We thought we were taking marbles out of the jar, but when in fact we were actually putting more marbles in the jar. And then on top of that, we might as well buy stock in Pepto-Bismol or, you know, Pepsi AC because... We go to bed with heartburn, we don't sleep well, but tomorrow we get up and this jar is more full than it was the day before. So what do we say to ourselves? F it, you know what sounds good. And the cycle repeats and repeats and repeats. Anyone ever been trapped in that cycle before? That, folks, is the cycle of emotional eating. And for a long time, you've been hearing this lie in your head that you're the only one that does it. But we just heard people confirm by a raise of hands, by a uh-uh, or some of you have a blank stare, a few people have tears welling up in their eyes. That says you are not alone. And what I found in my research with The Biggest Loser is people who are successful, people who are successful long-term, they understand that it's not just about calories in, calories out. Don't get me wrong, that equation matters. That is how you lose weight, it's not how you keep the weight off. At some point, you have to address what is your relationship with food. At some point, you have to be able to understand what are the emotions that lead you time and again to the same cycle over and over again. 
you know, in, in the program that we do, we have this belief that there's two or three primary emotions. It's almost like the ingredients of a cocktail. That if you put them together, you stir them up, on the right occasion, you, you're primed for Taco Bell, or you're primed for pizza, you're primed for ice cream. There's good stuff out there. There's good stuff out there. But what I had to learn is, for me, going back to my story, I had to learn that my dad left when I was three. Whether I wanted to acknowledge it or not, I was like, I was a little kid. I don't know why. I always had this fear of being left. Maybe it was linked to that, maybe not. You know what? That doesn't matter. The point being is that in key relationships where I would feel potentially rejected or potentially abandoned or potentially like I was gonna do something wrong, I just had to over accommodate or people please until I got everyone to feel okay because I didn't want anyone to go anywhere, right? And part of what food did is food stepped in and was an advocate and a savior for me in those moments. When I would feel afraid of being abandoned, food would step in and it would say, hey, I got your back, I'm right here with you. When I feel lonely or anxious, because I'm an extroverted person, I like to be around people. When I went home to that lonely house as a kid, I, I associated in my mind somewhere deep down loneliness with, with Hot Pockets. Loneliness with watching Sports Center and tuning out. So guys, when I say you need to understand what your relationship with food is really about, please hear me. This is about slaying shame. It's not about figuring out what your relationship with food is really about, like it's a bad thing. <laughs> food has been playing a role for some of you of being a comforter. Food has been with you at times when a parent was never there for you, when a, par a partner, a spouse, a friend would never reach back when you needed them to, food has been there for you. Food's not the villain, food's not the enemy. You have to first realize that and realize what emotions have you been eating for for so long. And naturally you might say, if I wanna be healthy for my kids, like me, that's what I say now, I got two of them. If I wanna be healthy for my kids, I have to renegotiate that relationship. But I couldn't do it from a place of shame. I had to do that from a place of compassion. How do you get to be comfortable with your body? Hold on, we'll get to questions at the end, Joe. Yeah. You have to look at your story from a place of compassion, not from shame. If I kept telling the same story that every time, ooh, I have a fear of abandonment, ooh, I'm afraid of being lonely or anxious, and I eat. Oh, why do I do that? You're never going to change something when you're hard on yourself in that sort of way. Part of what we do in the program that we told you guys about is that we help you renegotiate your relationship with food. Why? It's one of the, the things that's linked to long-term success. Now, when I get those feelings, I know how to actually acknowledge them, not shame myself for them, address them, talk them through, meditate on them, pray on them, work out as a way to take marbles out of that jar, right? Sometimes it actually does help. I've learned different ways to respond to those feelings, but it's not been by ignoring them. I had to own them. So if the question is for some of you today, what are the key emotions that you've been feeling for years and you've been predictably eating for? If you want to be successful long-term, if that's why you're here tonight, I empower you to have compassion for yourself, to identify those, and to take the stand to rewrite and renegotiate your relationship with food. So that's point number one. Point number two, people who are successful long-term, it's not about weight loss. I'm, I'm sorry, it's not about weight loss. The reason why you have that number in your head is you think that number is gonna make you worthy of love or self-acceptance or looking at your body in the mirror and going, I like what I see, right? We all wanna lose weight because it's the vehicle that we believe gets us to self-love and acceptance and a greater quality of relationships. It's not, don't worry. It's not a negative message I have to share with you. It's actually quite the opposite. The people who are successful, 
was a guy like Scott who walked in my office once. Scott sat on the couch across from me. And he said, you know, I don't even want to be here right now. I think therapy is a crock of you know what. I said, okay, it's fine. A lot of people have been here. Traditionally, men think that. I, I get it. He said, I'm here because the stupid weight loss center that I've gone to said I've gained back the weight too many times. I said, how many times? He's like, I don't know, nine or 10. I've lost 100 pounds nine or 10 times, and now they're saying I need psychological help, like I'm crazy or something. I said, don't worry, you're not crazy. And he said, I know I'm not. He said, in fact, I know this time will be different. I said, why will this time be different? He said, I'm sure you hear that a lot, right? This time's gonna be different. He said, I'll tell you right now, it's going to be different, Dr. Mondo. I promise you this time's gonna be different. I'm gonna lose the weight. It's gonna be a breeze. And I said, why? He said, because every time I lost the weight in the past and I looked in the mirror, I still hated myself. He said, now I'm sitting here today at 375 pounds and this big old shell I don't love the shell. I need to get rid of this, because if I don't, I'm not gonna be around for my kids long term. But this person, who I am, is valuable. Who I am is worthy. And I actually can sit here and say that I see myself and who I am separate than my body. And that's why I'm going to be successful in this next stage of the journey to lose the weight. And wouldn't you believe it, Scott lived that out. In our work together, all I did is just sit with him and give him a space to reflect some of his thoughts and just to, to just reflect back to him how amazing he is. And, and he lost the weight. But it wasn't about weight loss. In order to be successful long term, not only must you renegotiate your relationship with food, you must make this process not about weight loss, but about rewriting your story. What is the story that you tell about yourself? People always say, if there was a funeral for you, what would the eulogy be, right? Forget that. The eulogy is great for all of you. But for some of you, if not the majority of you, it sucks if you're the one delivering the eulogy. People can reflect to you so often all the great things about you, but you can't accept half of them because of the story you tell about yourself. I'm a firm believer that if you want to be successful in this journey in here, this being in here, moving those weights, exercising, that's an act of self-love. And it's an act of self-love for people that love themselves to begin with. Which means, I don't care where you are at now on that continuum or spectrum. Some of you are here because you're like, I gained the weight back. Honestly, you are worthy right now of that. That's the good news. Yeah, you might have to lose some weight in order to be around for your kids, in order to reset this history of diabetes and heart disease. But guess what? That has nothing to do with whether or not you're worthy, whether or not you're lovable, whether you're enough right now. You are not defined by the number on the scale. The sooner you realize that, you can walk out of here today with that belief system. And if you do, you will find that this becomes easier because this is an act of self-love once you love yourself. There's no pants size, there's no dress size, there's no number on the scale, I hope you hear me, that will ever make you truly feel worthy. There's none. Only you can build that within yourself. Only you can build that within yourself. Your self-worth can't be conditional. It can't be if I'm a size, it can't be if if my weight's a number, it can't be conditional. Otherwise, it simply will never last.
when you make your weight loss journey less about weight loss and more about the journey and more about rewriting your story, everything else always falls into place. That is the message that right now I'm trying to give you guys, that you are enough, you are worthy just the way you are right now. And if you can get even half of that, everything else in your relationship to food, everything else in your health journey, everything in your acceptance of your body image and who you are gets easier. We saw some, some, some of, uh, of my team walking around here tonight with these shirts. And um, these, these shirts really have changed a lot for me because I had to kind of figure out like what the foundation of rewriting my story is, or not my story, but our story. Like what, if I could identify it, what would it come down to? It would come down to these statements. This is, if I could give you guys one thing, it wouldn't be a shirt, it would be that you would actually wear these on your heart and not on your t-shirt. If I could give that to you, what I would want you to walk out of here tonight believing or beginning to believe is that you are worthy, 